and Behavioral Health Care. Kathleen O'Connor, Cascade Medical. Pat Sunger, Cascade Medical. Rosalinda Kitty, Columbia Basin Family Medicine. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> that was intense. <laughs> Blake Edwards, Columbia Valley Community Health. Krista Bellanu, Catholic Charities. Melody White, Family Health Centers. Linda Evans, Parlette, North Central ACH. And go ahead. John Chapman, North Central ACH. Christina Morgan, North Central ACH. Eric Duvall, North Central ACH. Danny Gleason, North Central ACH. Smith, North Central ACH. Brown, North Central ACH. Caroline Tillier, NCACH. And I'm Wendy Bresney, Whole Person Care Collaborative Manager for the North Central ACH. Welcome, everyone. And let's go ahead and go to the phone. Who do we have on the phone today? Rebecca Voith with CSI. Sheila Chilson, Moses Lake Community Health. Rachel Petro with PSS LLC. Christina Clark with CCMI. Kathy Rhymes, CSI. Jamie Hillier, Catholic Charities. Anyone else on the line? I see a few names that I haven't introduced yet. This is Molly Morris, Cooley Medical Center. Okay. Also looks like Haley from Columbia Basin Health Associates and Dulcie are on the line. And who else am I? Uh, Stephanie Dallin from Moses Lake Community Health and Tracy Miller from Mid Valley and one, two, three, four, four phones and Lena Mitchell from Grant County Health District. And Shoshana Plementier from Lee Medical Center. Just speeding up the process a little bit. Thanks for everyone for joining us on this lovely May day. Um, let's take a look at your Agenda should be in front of you. And if you have a minute, I have a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Thanks, Paul. Second? Seconded. Mr. Chris seconds. All in favor? All opposed? And I do not have minutes. We have minutes in front of us? All right, I'll bring the minutes next time. We, for, I forgot. I won't say we. I forgot to print we. them off. <laughs> I'll take it. It's the all good. We. <laughs> the royal we. The royal I at the moment. <laughs> we'll bring them next next meeting, but they will be uploaded on the website if you're interested. Hey, announcements. I have a couple things I wanted to share. Um, first. Next WPCC meeting in June will be in Moses Lake at Big Bend Community College. So please take note. I know last time we had someone show up here when it was in Okanagan. So we'll send out another reminder. It will be in Moses Lake at Big Bend. And on the calendar invite will be the address. It's at the ATEC building, I believe, which is where the summit was. So for all of you who put the um, GPS <laughs> for Big Bend and ended up at their dormitory and was Confused? Take note, it's at the ATEC, which is the library, so also the library building. Um, microphones, can I ask you guys to go ahead and turn your microphones off until you're ready to speak? I know those online tend to tell us there's a lot of shuffling of papers. Turn them on. But when, yeah, turn them on when you do speak, and if you don't, I hate interrupting, so I do have a sign that Teresa helped me with to remind you to turn your microphone on. So, just so you know, it does say please. So. <laughs> um, as many of you know, I've been doing site visits with Mariah, Heather, and Linda's joined us on a few, and one of the 
few of the visits. So one of the questions I've been asking is about value-based payment. I do have a couple sites left to visit. So if you haven't been visited, you've been working with your schedule. So I think I have CVCH. So you guys are in the middle of a craziness and we put that off and Columbia Basin Family Medicine, which is coming up, I think are my last two. Um, during those discussions, I've asked, what are your thoughts about VBP? Because we had the um, presentation from J.D. Fisher last month, and so we just wanted to hear where is everyone at? We thought you may want to know what others are thinking, so um, just kind of consolidated. What we did learn is there's a difference when it comes to VBP conversation, when you're talking to a rural health clinic versus a FQHC. And it seems like most of the FQHCs, if not all, are on some form of VBP payment. Um, and many of the RHCs are not. And some of them have said they haven't even been approached by the MCOs regarding VBP. So they're at the very beginning where others are some more advanced. So which we knew there would be all along the continuum. Some of the current concerns for those who are on VBP is that it's only a bonus payment. So there, um, there's the concerns of moving forward of how is this gonna sustain us. It's only a fraction of that operating budget um, and a very minute one. So. Um, they're still seeing a lot of encounters and they're trying to do the value-based payment quality metrics So they're doing more and getting paid less so to speak um, because they're at the same amount or the the bonus payment as was described is um, just a fraction of the cost um, a couple have talked about there's a cost cap that has to be met before receiving the quality metric so if you have one um, catastrophic event like a preemie who's in the NICU um, that just totally wipes out your cost cap and then you're not going to get any of your quality metric payments And so some things are beyond their control. So it's concerns um, Another organization talked about the moving target that you set up um, Systems to address an, uh, a quality metric and um, everyone starts doing well in that quality metric and that quality metric gets changed and so there's no there's no more funding because that quality metric's no longer there, so there's no value-based payment for that quality metric because now you're looking at another. Yet it does cost to sustain what you've already implemented, and where is that funding going to come from? So those who are moving into value-based contracts, the fear of the unknown is probably the biggest one. They don't know um, what the expectations and how it will affect their bottom line. This was a graph that I found and it was what I had visualized as the fee-for-service goes down and the value-based payment comes up. There's going to be this gap um, where payments go down that the, um, the clinics are receiving and I heard this most often in the RHCs and they are uh, working on a very fine line and trying to keep their doors open as it is. So to have this dip um, in revenue is Want to hurt them and so that really is the concern and oops it's not, it's a PDF. Okay. Um, so it is a really the concern of um, um, most of the clinics again doing more getting paid less the technology does not support the reporting is another big one um, these quality metrics um, are, the facilities are asked to give them, but they don't have the technology to be able to get the quality metrics out of them, um, nor do they have the funding necessarily to be able to do that because they're already on such tight margins. Um, building new reports, um, when they're asked to give more metrics, they're gonna have to build new reports. That costs money for those who cannot build them in-house, um, and they, again, don't have the money to do that, or they, if they're using the money, they're taking it from patient care. Um, equity issue, um, rural population has poor health outcomes. Sorry for that misspelling. Um, or it's probably behind the picture. So um, when you're moving into value-based payment and you're looking at it statewide, you're rural, so you know that your, um, your patient population has poorer health outcomes than someone in more high, higher affluent neighborhoods. So there's that concern. And adding to the documentation and reporting requirement increases administrative burden, and that is not reimbursable. Because we all know if we're documenting, we're not doing patient care. And most of our providers we talk to just want to do patient care, and not all that reporting. So those are pretty much what I learned. Does anyone want to add to it or have a short discussion, comments, feedback? You turn your microphone on. <laughs> no.
Uh, <laughs> probably better said off the microphone. I, I think we're in the same boat. I mean, I think one of our biggest challenges is that we negotiate contracts every six months. So we're negotiating for this back January. So anything we're doing is, is really trying to play catch up. So talking about reporting, if we wanted to have a specific reporting built into the system, it's going to cost us $68,000 to develop the report. So do we negotiate for that now or do we negotiate for the, that in June when we're negotiating the next six months? So it's a huge challenge. Any other challenges either in the room or on the phone that you that I didn't have on here? Because not everyone was in those site visits. I'll say that for the NCOs. <laughs> Working with the MCOs, they, they, they all expect their reporting to be done a little bit differently. Uh, while they have the same mandates from the state, they're passed on to us differently. So they may, they, they don't all, they're not all uniform. So it's just the fact that you want 68,000 for reporting, it may be 68,000 for one of the MCOs and not the other because they wanted, they also want it in a different format. Yes. Um, it's so it's made it difficult. I mean, that, and it's not unique to the MCOs and Medicaid. It's unique to every insurance and everybody else. They all want something a little bit differently if they want you to provide it versus using claims-based data. <clears throat> and I will say on the claims-based data, those in rural health clinics have said that they don't like that mechanism because it doesn't capture all the work because not everything can be billed. Um, if it's a zero dollar, then it wipes off billing, so it's never caught, captured in claims. So the system as it is now is flawed. We do know that, but we did hear from healthcare authority this morning and they know that there are some struggles and they are working on, um, as we are sending them this type of information, they are working on it and they will be working with MCOs as well and talking to the providers to see how, again, to best move organizations to value-based payment. So more to come on that. I did want to give an opportunity, um, something that we heard from the learning activity survey, and I thought I would just translate it into this meeting, is you want to hear from your partners. You want to hear what's going on. So I just thought I would add this for every meeting. If, as an organization, you have something you want to share, an update or announcement, something different, change in administration, change in people that are pertinent to this project, if you want to share it, um, now would be a good time to do that. It is now. I wasn't thinking of that because I didn't know he was coming. But So um, I'd like to introduce Pat Songer. He's our new COO uh, out at Cascade Medical. And I guess you could say something to introduce himself. <laughs> no, that was good. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my last little step was in New Orleans, but I came from UC Health out of uh, Colorado. We're glad to have him on board. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Anyone online have anything they want to share? Feel free to unmute your mic or chat it in. We are watching the chat box. Hey, let's move on to learning activities. Um, when we were in Okanagan, so that was back in March, we had the conversation about learning activities and the value of them. We sent out a survey um, to assess what the WPCC want in, in regards to learning activities. At the same time, Caroline and I had a conversation about looking at previous learning activities. It was mentioned, can we look at a six month out assessment? We are at, I think the, the behavioral health um, the behavioral health integration learning activity ended in December, so we're not even six months out on our first learning activity um, to get that far out. But what Caroline did was took the three um, learning activities, the behavioral health into primary care, primary care into behavioral health, those ran simultaneously, and then subsequently the impanelment sprint, and put them into some um, infographics, and I will let her talk about those. Um. So they're in your packet, I'm not going to go through everything, but we realize that we receive a lot of information from the learning activities that we haven't necessarily shared out with you and thought it was important, especially because a couple months ago there was a discussion of like what topics 
to put into the VLAN and, and was it responsive to people's needs? Were the learning activities meeting people's needs? So we thought it would be helpful for you to just hear both the highlights and then also the feedback from the people who participated in the learning activities we've had to date. And also you can see the scores on the four basic questions that are asked um, at the end of each learning activity. So in short, I think what's, what's great for us as an ACH is to realize that um, the workshops and the learning activities are meeting your needs. You would recommend them to others um, and you are confident that you will use those skills um, in your work. And just so you know, when we go to the next slide here, you'll see some of some advice for land improvement. So we look at that carefully with Roger and his team as we roll out other learning activities. So um, feel free to continue to be very honest in your feedback because we're trying to meet varying needs as best we can. It's not always going to be perfect for everyone, but we're trying to find that happy medium. Um, the learning activity for primary care and to behavioral health um, had fewer organizations participating, but a lot of individual participants, again, scores tended to show that um, people were satisfied with the information, it was relevant, and that they were going to use the content with a few outliers. And then the impanelment sprint, um, pretty much similar, similar patterns. But I encourage you to kind of take a closer look at the detailed feedback that pre people provided, both the highlights and the challenges. Um, they'll probably resonate for you too. And then if, if, as you read those, you think of anything that can help us shape good learning activities going forward, please let us know. We, we try to really build things that will um, be meaningful. So that's it in a nutshell. Are there any questions? I can't remember if there's another one. Nope, that's it. And we'll continue to share those out as we wrap up each learning activity. Um, and I don't know, maybe we'll post these on the portal or that way you can always go check it out. So, Any questions, feedback, comments? Okay. So some of the things that we do have coming up, we have the next QI Affinity Group coming up. Um, in May and it looks like we will be doing some more value stream mapping along the way. I put that in there. So if you have something that you want to map, um, Tina is looking for individuals um, who would be willing to map their process out. I know a couple of organizations who are thinking about it, but if it's something that you want to do, you'll do it with the group with the help of Tina, um, at least give you a, a start and then you can take it back to your team. Um, some other topics they're looking at is data-driven improvement, using your improvement drive data to drive learning and improvement. Um, more conversation on PDSAs and what is everyone testing. So bring what you're testing within your organization to the call. Um, ask questions, get feedback, um, and just let us know the good work you're doing, some of the successes you've had. And what are the early wins that you're seeing? Um, what is everyone working through? Um, just looking at it from that quality improvement uh, perspective, these calls are once a month, and it's just really to support you and your work on the ground. So any kind of feedback, if you don't feel like you want to ask the question online, feel free to email it to myself or to Tina Clark, and she would um, bring that question then to the group. We do have a motivational interviewing train the trainer in June. Um, we have a few individuals who are Paul is the only one completed application at the moment. We have one other individual who is one statement away and probably five or six that are finishing up their recordings for their brief action planning and um, MI recording they have to do prior to being accepted. So looking at a good cohort, the reason I mention it is because we will have that capacity within our region, those trainers who will then be able to offer trainings. Um, locally, wherever they're at. And we've asked them, since this has been provided them through the WPCC, we ask that when they do hold the training that they invite um, ACH partners to that. So that return on investment of what we're given that they give back. Uh, it also adds to that collaborative learning. Um, team roles for primary care integration behavioral health workshop is on Wednesday. This was something that we did jointly with Better Health Together ACH in Spokane. Um, we reached out to all the behavioral health organizations and specifically we didn't necessarily announce it um, 
but that's coming up on Wednesday. I think we have four organizations sending a team of uh, three to four individuals to this training. Um, there's also patient and family voice and QI workshop that's coming up at the end of May. Um, if you haven't signed up, if you're interested in that, um, that is available. So if you're trying to include the, the patient or the family's voice in the work that you're doing, whether they're adding them to their QI team or just trying to include their voice, they're going to go through different ways you can do that. So it may not be formally, it could be a little more informally, but um, a lot of good things on that come in. The last one I felt to put on here was um, the land that's coming up, and that's the, um, sorry, my brain just went blank. Team-based care. <laughs> I see team roles, and that's all that wanted to come out was team roles. So team-based care, and this is actually for primary care and for behavioral health, and Kathy's on the line. I think she's going to give you guys the spiel on that because I think it's pretty exciting. Kathy? Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, we're really excited about this one. So um, team-based care, as you can imagine, uh, just across all of you sitting in the room, each of you have a different kind of team that works in your organization. So what we've decided to do here, um, I have a team-based care expert that I've been working with in Colorado. And I keep he hearing wonderful things from the practices, so I'm really happy to um, be able to share her expertise. What we've decided to do is there will be a typical LAN type of format as we've done before with sessions that are uh, an hour and a half long over the lunch hour. So I was just reading the feedback, so we're trying to listen to you. Um, the, the sessions will be three weeks apart instead of two weeks apart to give you a little more time to do homework because certainly the, the team-based care should be done by the entire team. I want to be clear that the entire team is not expected to come to all of the learning sessions. That's too high a bar. But it would be helpful if those who are not in attendance could at least listen to the content portion. The assignments that you'll have will be based on the content of each session. The other thing that we'll do is there'll be more peer sharing time. And at your request, we will facilitate um, those team sharing sessions. Again, they'll be related to the content and give you an idea to, to just take in the content and uh, then put it into your own context. The topics that we'll be talking about include team culture, team communication, psychological safety on teams, change fatigue and improvement, multi-generational work teams, complex systems and teams. And so all of those will be pertinent to everybody on the phone and in the room. But we realize that real team-based care and improving uh, teams within your organization is contextual. And so what we're going to offer is for each participating organization, um, they can participate in a team assessment, a validated tool to look at strengths and weaknesses of your team, whatever team you select. And then we will offer customized coaching based on the assessment tool. And we'll decide together, the faculty and the team will decide together where to be, uh, best place efforts, and then we'll coach and provide resources that are customized to your team. So we are really looking forward to the opportunity to work with you. Um, Team-based care, as many of you in the room know, is associated with the biggest move in patient-centered outcomes. So if we can get our teams working well, uh, we really think we can do something special uh, within uh, North Central. So that is um, a brief overview. I'm happy to answer questions. And uh, I should have said that this will begin on June 5th. There will be a bit of pre-work, because as I mentioned, we will want to have you choose a team um, from your organization. We'll need team email addresses so that we can get that assessment out to you. And the assessments are done individually. Each team member does their own assessment. It's not done together as a team. That way we encourage everyone to be honest. Uh, the results will not be shared except in aggregate. 
So what we're really trying to understand is what's working, what's not working so well. So the, and then there are strategies to uh, really improve how teams work together. So that's really the intent of this. And again, we'll be pulling in additional TA as we need it. Um, anything that has to do with specific roles, responsibilities, workflows, that type of thing, we may need some additional assistance and expertise. And you have plenty in Washington State to draw from. Um, I think that's it, Wendy. Microphone, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and that's supposed to start June 5th. Um, that registration should be open within the next day or two. I will be sending an email out with the syllabus um, for you to register. If you register each team member, that's how we'll capture their email address. Um, and that will help the faculty. Any questions on any of the learning activities that we are planning or coming up? What did we decide the B and B land stood for? Is that blended land? The bee land, land, the bee land. We were trying to figure out what that is. That blended land. It is, is and oh. and that is something that we're working on that doesn't happen until the fall. Oh. And so what we're trying to do is blend all the stuff that we've been talking about: the, the QI, the motivational interviewing, the team-based care, the impanelment. Um, all of these things are going to be blended together to pr produce a learning activity that ties it all around a specific topic such as depression or diabetes. Make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Any other questions? Comments? Feedback? Okay. Then we are going to turn it over to Melody. Melody's doing some fun stuff with her change plan and how she's, um, uh, as you know, Family Health Centers has six different sites. And so I asked her to share on how she is spreading the change plan work over the multiple sites. I'll give that to you to advance. <laughs> Yeah, I was excited to hear that we're going to start um, uh, committing some time to do the peer sharing. I'm excited about that. I know that our change plan will not look the same now as it does in six months and a year and three years. So I'm excited about learning what other people are doing so that we can learn from that and kind of fine tune what we're doing at Family Health Centers. Um, I had a kind of a fun experience a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> my nephew took uh, for my sister's 60th birthday, he took us paragliding. And there were several things that I found that kind of uh, reflected some of the things that we're doing in the change plan. Um, one of those things <laughs> was the fact that um, The, when I first um, met him, he asked me if it was my first time, and, and I said yes, and he said me too, which, um, and for him, I think that that was probably a tired joke that he tells about five or six times a day, but I think for us, that's probably true, that we're all learning as we're going, and we're jumping off this cliff. Um, the other thing um, was, is that when he was asking me, okay, what are you worried about? It, I wasn't worried about the trip, I was worried about the takeoff and the landing. And he said, okay, well, well, we can walk through that. When you take off, make sure that you never quit running. As fast as you can, you never quit running. Because if you quit running, then I'll trip over you and we'll fall down this thousand foot cliff. <clears throat> and he said, and besides that, it may feel a little counterintuitive, but about halfway through our running process, you're going to feel this huge tug backwards. And that's the most important time where you have to keep running as fast as you can. And I thought, aha, that probably sounds like where we're at at about a year and a half. Um, and then he said, when it comes to the landing, instead of putting your feet down and bracing yourself for this, this impact and protecting yourself, you have to lift your feet up and then start walking, and then you'll walk yourself out of this process. And I think that's exactly what we're expecting NCACH and the HCA to do as we come out of the next three years is that we're having a lot of trust factors that – so that when we get done with this thing, there's going to be something that's, that's really great for whole person care and the value-based payment. And so that requires a lot of trust. Um, 
So what we've done at Family Health Centers, um, because it is a little bit of a challenge with multiple sites, and I know that others have that same situation, um, we're doing uh, some subcommittee type uh, projects. And as just a little bit of a background on what we've done so far, I think we're probably in agreement as far as the, the big things being behavioral health integration is new for primary care clinics. Um, ACEs and trauma-informed care, that's something that Family Health Centers has really embraced over the past year, year and a half, and I think it's going to be crucial in what we're trying to accomplish there. The motivational interviewing part of it, I think, is going to be super important, and I'm looking forward to that training, since it will be important, particularly for our organization, not, so, not just when it comes to patient interaction, but trying to establish positive uh, reception for what it is that we're trying to do for the staff so that it really does become their project and not administration's project. Um, I would think one of the, the, the struggles and the frustrations that we're dealing with right now is the same that everyone else is. We, we had this fantastic day of the, the annual summit where we spent almost the entire day talking about social determinants of health and the impact and how important those things were on that Friday. And all of us went back to the same old world on Monday. And it was how, how many visits, what's our fee for service, how are we going to pay for all of this, all of that. And, and that struggle for how do, we, how do we accomplish that while we're still got, we've still got one foot in fee for service or uh, production based revenue and one foot in, yes, we understand how important it is, but at this point, we really don't have a robust way to pay for it. Um, I think that it, as we're dealing with a lot of these lands and the training opportunities, one of the things that has been really um, empowering for me is to listen to the other people that have the very same concerns that we have. And I, I do think that one of the things that we are going to have to do, which is, again, counterintuitive for healthcare, is the understanding that until our system is perfected, we're going to have to depend on community partners in order to help us address those social determinants of, of um, health aspects. <clears throat> the key factors for uh, what we're doing as far as how we're implementing it is we are not treating the change plan as a special project. Oh, I didn't go forward. Oh, you got okay. Now I get distracted. So uh, instead of having the change plan as a special committee or a special project, we're taking the change plan, uh, people that are already aware of what's going on and, and kind of are already at kind of a passion around this and we're embedding those into our existing meetings. So we have an agenda item on each of our medical provider meetings, our, our clinic site flow meetings, our leadership meetings, quick meeting, our quality improvement meetings, all of those things have a factor for the change plan so that we're not asking people to give up more of their time for meetings and, and to have it be considered this is the project of the day, that this is how we're going to move our organization forward as a whole instead of having it just be the flavor of the day type of a project. Um, as you, most of you know, Jesus, and you know he, he already has a real passion for community collaboration, particularly in the uh, education department. And I think that that's one thing that we have been very blessed with our administration and our board is that they are committed to making sure that those uh, relationships that we have, particularly with the, the school departments and things like that, are really strong. And we have been able to do several different projects, particularly in the areas of leadership training and things like that for our uh, middle school uh, kids, and that has been really helpful. We've also done some things as far as embedding family health centers in with uh, school nursing into some of the school districts there so that we actually have an impact with that. Another really exciting thing for family health centers is the fact that our transition to Athena as a new EHR is coming at the absolute perfect time. We have been able to use, and that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, but it has been a real um, disguised blessing. Um, we were able to do a couple of lands right before the end of the year, and we were able to use some of the things that we learned from the behavioral health integration, and we did a small project with asthma care through our patient access subcommittee. And being able to evaluate what were, what were our workflows that were 
were not going to work in a change plan environment. So that as we're training our providers and our staff, the new workflows within Athena, we're already building in the changes. So they're not even recognizing the fact that we're changing workflows. Um, instead of taking everything we were doing in NextGen and doing it fairly similarly within Athena, we're changing the workflow and then teaching them the new workflow at the same time as they're, they're learning a new system, which allows them to be able to absorb one change as opposed to two. Um, that's working really well. We did our training last week for Athena and our providers have been really positive about the what, the, what we're trying to do. Um, we go live on the 14th and please wish us well. <laughs> um, the other thing that we did in the last year, which has been really helpful, is we established a call center so that we can specially train our people who are on the front lines uh, dealing with our patients on the phone to be able to do more um, social determinants of health conversations with our patients when they're calling in. A lot of times, as you know, if you have a patient receptionist, they're a lot of times hearing the stories. And a lot of times we're having to cut them off with their story because they have three people lined up at their front desk. They've got people they need to check in. The phone is ringing. And by having, I think we're, we're at about nine for our call center staff right now, with having that kind of support and then the rollovers to our patient receptionist, we're allowing our call center staff to be able to tune in and look for those times where we really need to, to give them the time to talk to the patient in crisis and factor that into how do we then route this person. It may be that they're calling in uh, for an appointment with the primary care provider and honestly what they need is a behavioral health intervention at this point. And so by being able to spend enough time getting the, the story for that patient and really evaluating and training that call center to be intuitive about what it is they're trying to accomplish. It may, it allows us to, now we've saved frustration on the patient's part because they didn't really get what they, they needed from a primary care provider. They went directly to the person that can help from what they need. So that's been a really positive thing. Got me again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Another few things that I have been really lucky, I feel, within my organization, um, one of them is I was given an opportunity to take a new position as the Transformation Health Manager, which is kind of a dream job for me. I, having been in uh, clinic management and special projects and things like that, um, this is, the, it, this is the, really the fun stuff for me and, and being able to kind of create what this looks like and, and how can that role be as successful as possible and as um, productive as possible within a large organization is, is, has been a really great thing. The other thing is they, the board and administration took a great big step back to look at what has, has been a roadblock in the, the past with trying to implement some of these changes. And a lot of the times that has been from the standpoint of not enough provider participation in what exactly we were trying to implement. And uh, as a result of that, and conversation around that. They have changed how they um, allocate provider resources. So we have, instead of having just a medical director who is also a clinician and an assistant medical director who is a part-time retired provider, um, we have now added several different uh, providers. We have uh, Dr. Smith, who is a naturopath, who is helping me with the change plan specifically and with quality improvement. We have Kathleen Manso, who's, who's spearheading our OTN project, and Kevin Cooley, who is doing our um, palliative care uh, efforts with, with that, and also Amanda Seegers, who will be helping with our process improvement. So we have a, I think it's about a four hour per week allocation of their time towards the change plan. And so they may become ambassadors back to their peers back at the individual sites so that they can be um, excited about what it is that they're planning. They give an opportunity to the providers who are not at those planning meetings so that they can be heard. And then at, again, at each of our medical provider meetings once a month, we have a change plan agenda item on there so that we can talk about what it is that we're doing with all of those areas. <clears throat> uh, we did do the, uh, we've, we've been involved with any of the lands that we've done so far. 
we were able to do the behavioral health integration land. That was a, a good success and a good start there. Uh, the impanelment sprint, because of our Athena transfer, will, won't get super going until we've got the reporting capabilities after uh, we go live next week. And then, the, and we believe that the impanelment piece of it is going to be that critical role that, that kind of sets the stage for where we're going next. And then um, we're looking forward to the team case, uh, team care. Okay, almost done. Let's see here. So for this year, um, again, we've been working on our workflows for Athena. Um, we go live next week. The subcommittees have gone on hiatus for the first quarter because of the fact that we have expected our subcommittee, um, we have a clinic manager, a lead RN, a provider, behavioral health provider, and then a staff level for each subcommittee. So for our eight topics, there's a subcommittee that's, that's randomized around the clinic at, at, from our six sites. Um, each of those subcommittees have been meeting while we have been on hiatus for the change plan around Athena workflows and how that fits in with what, how it affects their topic. So they've been kind of building their team dynamics, even though we haven't necessarily been doing things that are specific projects around their topic. Um, and then as we go live and we, we head into the next quarter, uh, each of the subcommittees will be meeting at least once a month. Some of them are meeting weekly, some of them are meeting twice a month, depending on what their project requires. And as we proceed, then at least quarterly, we will have a representative from each of our subcommittees to report back at leadership and the medical provider meetings. And we will then share that information of what they have learned, um, do this do the shared PDSA so that um, one of the things that we learned with our asthma project was that by digging into asthma, we found uh, improvements for our reporting along with all of our other clinical major reports. So that, that there were those fine-tuning things that we didn't necessarily have to change workflows. In order to get a better uh, reporting score, we actually needed to fix our reports. And so what we fixed in asthma, we found we had to fix in diabetes and all of these other things. So that has been really helpful. Um, so our, the, their the subcommittees will continue to meet. We'll share that information. Um, and then for the spread, as each clinic kind of comes to the end of that first PDSA circle, cycle and we share that information, uh, we then we want to make sure that we're taking what we learned in that site and then evaluating how and when does this truly correlate for another site. And when do we need to tweak that a little bit so that it is completely um, taking into account the differences because we have different providers in some location, we have different space restrictions, uh, we have different set of staff, and our patients really require and expect different things from our clinic at different locations. So we'll be making that into part of our, our second phase of the PDSA cycle so that when we do our, our first trial at a different location will we'll give them two choices they can either have their ambassador for that new system, uh, work stream go to the place where it's working well or they can have someone come from the clinic where it was originally piloted and go to the clinic that's now implementing it so that we have side by side shoulder to shoulder mentoring for how the the uh, embracing clinic is is going to do that and then take our our cycles there and again, coming back to what we have been taught in all of our lands, making sure that we're then assigning someone for the continuation of that so that it's not, again, just a project of the day and that someone is going to be doing follow-up and continuing to do PDSAs on that new work stream. So that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, Melody. Any comments, questions for Melody? You know, it could be a little different for those sites who are just a single site, but you can tell for those who have multi-sites, this is an example of how they've chosen to approach their change plan. <laughs> just reminded about microphone, just in case. 
All right. Well, thanks, Melody. We appreciate. And we will continue with this peer sharing. I have a couple ideas for next month, so don't be surprised if I approach one of you after our site visits. I've learned a lot. So for the chais, I'm going to hand it over to Sahara and Kelsey. You guys going to spread? And we should have Lena Mitchell on the phone. Lena, are you out there? Okay. She's on. She's on. Let's see if we can get her chatting. Um, but perfect. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Sahara Suval. I work with the North Central Accountable Community of Health. Um, I have with me today Kelsey Gust and Lena Mitchell. Um, so before I dive into this, um, who here has heard of our Coalitions for Health Improvement? Awesome. Awesome. Who here has been to a Coalition for Health Improvement meeting? Cool. Okay. Um, so the Coalitions for Health Improvement, uh, they um, were formed prior to uh, the ACH forming. Um, they, when the original uh, SIM grant was issued, uh, the Coalitions for Health, for health Improvement convened key stakeholders and leaders in health um, to help us kind of visualize what this was going to look like for the region. Since then, the, the chais, as they are called, um, have really become our, our venue for kind of countywide uh, forums on, on health and in particular social determinants of health challenges. Uh, they tend to have um, quite a few of our non-clinical, our community-based partners, so a lot of the folks that are helping support all of the work that you do, and many of your partners are in these rooms as well. Um, the chais themselves, so when we thought about like how do we give this update, the long and short is that each chai, there are three of them, there's one for Chelan and Douglas, one for Grant County, and one for Okanagan County. They all have really formed, they have similar goals and charges, but they all have their own kind of local level identity and local level needs and challenges. So we wanted to break this into um, county level, except for Chelan Douglas, which is two counties. Uh, so with that, I want to hand this over to Kelsey Gus, um, who is the, um, Special Projects Coordinator for both the Chelan Douglas and the Okanagan County Chais. Um, and the ACH, just so you know, actually supports um, the Chais with annual funding that covers operating costs as well as a staff member to help coordinate Chai activities. Okay. So the Chelan Douglas Chai um, worked on choosing different focus areas for 2019, and those are relief housing crisis, capacity development and community empowerment, sustainability change, sustainable change, and parenting programs. And for the housing crisis and the parenting programs, we've been working on trying to find the gaps that are not currently being met or working on. Um, also in July of 2018, the CHI received an email that the uh, local organization has clients that needed help getting to and from work and interviews. Um, so the CHI hosted a Schland Douglas Rides to Work Forum in October. From there, two subcommittees were formed. Um, one is working on a pilot project for a volunteer program and developing an emergent needs community fund. The other is working on the Rides to Work Town Halls. Um, that is to hear more solutions from the community, and that is the flyer. And these are being hosted, I can't see from far the away. The next one from. is in Bridgeport on Thursday, um, Rock Island and Kashmir. So there are seven places throughout the two counties. So some of the challenges we have encountered. Um, integration um, with the CHI and getting more community members involved. Um, I go out and do outreach to different community members at the library and different various events, um, I, but we are having trouble getting them to the meetings. Um, so then we also are trying to find the right verbiage to help community members understand what we are working on. Um, we would like the chais to be more of a meeting where we have action and actionable items. So we're, we just don't want it to be just a meeting that we just attend. 
Um, we are also working on coordinating with other chais to make sure that we're all on the same page. And so the Shlin Douglas Chai in three years would like to be self-sustaining with the leadership structure and also um, improve the social determinants of health in Shlin and Douglas counties and just the overall quality of health with the community members. Okay. Lena, able to chat in? Can you hear me? We can. Okay. So, as far as the Greentown Chai goes, uh, we are currently partnering with two local task forces within the county. One is the Grant County Suicide Prevention Task Force, the other is the Homeless Task Force. Um, so we're really trying to work on a lot of very upstream work, um, kind of focused on that harm reduction piece, and then also incorporating uh, all age groups within Grant County um, and partnering with some, uh, I would say, pretty non-traditional partners that we're still working to get to the table. Uh, some challenges that the CHI has is just generating new members, kind of like what Kelsey said, you know, it's always difficult for um, different partners really of being able to identify themselves within the CHI. Um, and then within our county, a lot of our current residents are pretty tapped out. They uh, are very involved in a variety of different projects and task forces throughout the community, so asking them to attend another meeting or uh, be involved in another work group can be pretty overwhelming to folks. Um, and I think initially our, we really wanted more worker bees, which we still do, the boots on the ground work, um, you know, the local nonprofits and things like that. And that's still one of our main um, aims. And then just really breaking down the silos between the region. I think that we've done a pretty good job with that, but always striving towards that. So three years from now, we would hope to have a pretty robust sector representation. Um, pieces of our work, especially within the, both of the task forces I already spoke to, address opioid overdoses and deaths, so we'd want to reduce, um, reduce both of those, also have some sort of a tracking mechanism so we can easily identify those numbers. Um, expand our MIT providers and SUD treatment, again, that both of those areas kind of align uh, in a roundabout way with both task forces that we work with. Um, just have diverse sector representation in both of the task forces that uh, we partner with. And um, really work to expand the homeless task force throughout the county. It's a little bit Moses Lake centric right now and I know that that's always a goal within that task force. So just helping others identify that role. And then just maintain awareness of the diverse population that we have throughout our very large county. Great, thank you, Lena. All right, and we'll transition to Okanagan, our neighbors mm -hmm. up north. So Okanagan Chai, um, they worked on in the top four focus areas for 2019 that is reproductive health, behavioral health, access to care and ACEs, and again, it's to find those gaps that are current not, currently not being med, met. Um, we had a reproductive health panel in March, um, so quite a few different uh, stakeholders, CEOs of hospitals were on the panel to help describe the issues and challenges um, that are happening in Okanagan County currently. Um, so some of the challenges, uh, we would like more education at the CHIs, uh, all the social determinants of health partners, um, and then also we are working on reducing silos. Uh, the Okanagan CHI leadership has decided to use it for networking also. Um, so during that time, attendees can speak about issues and events happening in Okanagan County to help reduce those silos. So in three years, we'd like to reduce opioid deaths and ODs. Um, 
by doing that, 100% of the agencies would be trained or using Narcan. Um, having a, tra a transitional and recovery house up there and expand local services for SED and overall improving the social determinants of health in Okanagan County. Um, a lot of focus has been around the opioid crisis also. And I will put in a plug for the Okanagan County CHI's next meeting, which is the end of May. Um, some of you may have gotten invitations from Peter Morgan already, maybe not. Um, mm -hmm. But it was really exciting to, I will segue into saying it was really exciting to get to hear from Family Health Centers uh, because our leadership council, so each of the coalitions has a group of volunteers who help um, determine not only the meeting agendas, but the strategic direction of the CHI, helping identify these focus areas, et cetera. They would like to hear from their whole person care collaborative partners at the Okanagan County CHI meeting, and in particular, some of your change plan goals and how um, the community and the broader community and some of the non-clinical partners up there can support your change plan goals uh, and really help us all move towards you know, improved health together. Um, so keep an eye out for, for those of you who are Okanagan-based for an invitation, um, and we're hoping to have another uh, panel and discussion format uh, for, for our next meeting up in Okanagan County. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, quickly um, some funding that has become available for the Coalitions for Health Improvement. Um, so those of you who attend our governing board meetings and follow along, um, in December of last year, the governing board actually approved $450,000 to be invested into local and regional level health projects. Um, and this funding was to be managed with oversight from the Coalitions for Health Improvement. So this really wasn't intended to be like a quick rapid cycle grants program. This was really um, intended to be to fund projects that are informed by the community and, and are really um, within the scope of the things that the coalitions themselves want to work on and focus on and address. So to that point, uh, in January of this year, we actually formed an advisory group that has representation from all three of the coalitions. They function very similarly to our other Medicaid transformation project work groups. Um, I have been working with them, um, and they have been working hard, let me tell you folks. Uh, we have identified um, funding priorities, as well as a community investment process. Um, so this has been developed. We're still working on a few different pieces, but I'm really excited to share that um, this process has touch points from coalitions within it so we have even before folks submit project applications for this funding there's an opportunity for them to actually go in front of the coalitions and to get feedback on um, their proposed project for maybe for the coalitions to do a little bit of partner matchmaking um, across the region and to really help kind of maximize our efforts together um, so more information is going to be released in the coming months about this um, and any uh, any final approvals in terms of our process going live, applications going live for funding to be allocated and distributed actually does have to go back to the governing board. Um, so more information to come with all of this. Um, but I do, as, as you are thinking about this as an opportunity on the right horizon, as you're um, in particular, uh, how do you um, bridge some of those community clinical linkages or gaps? Um, that there will be some limitations to WPCC member organizations that are interested in applying for funding. Um, more to come with all of that, um, but just that we have some funding. The CHIs have been thinking a lot around this, and we are excited to roll this process and opportunity out to the community in the next few months. And I am not qualified to be near microphone. <laughs> uh, and I. Um, I guess in thinking about your uh, goals with your change plans and within the Medicaid transformation projects um, and kind of this overarching vision of improving health across our region, um, we at the coalitions, we really want to support your change plan goals uh, and partner to provide the best care possible across our communities. Um, so I put the dates and times of the next uh, CHI meetings that are happening this month. If you're available to go or to send somebody from your organization, we highly encourage you to join us. Um, and we have also developed a Facebook. Uh, so for those of you who are either managing social media pages or 
for your organizations or you have a personal social media, um, it's a good way to engage with us. We're really trying to use it to really just amplify a lot of the good work that's already happening out there. Um, and I guess I would just end on that. Um, please do think of the chat as kind of this this space to help convene partners and really help foster those connections so that your clinic walls really extend into the community. Um, and with that, I would open it up for any questions, um, thoughts, or comments that folks may have for Kelsey, Lena, or myself. Okay. Thank you so much for letting us come and share. Thank you, Kelsey, Lena, you. and Sahara. Um, we started doing this out of uh, response to WPTC members who wanted to know what else was going around the going on in the ACH and how does that really relate to the WPCC and I thought I don't think I need to say more because they did a very good job at uh, bridging that gap of what's happened locally um, within individual counties to the work that's w going on in WPCC. So please reach out to them if you're interested. This is your chance to really get down into the nitty-gritty on the local level outside of your four walls. Um, and addressing those issues. So now I will hand it over to Roger, who will continue our leadership dialogue. Great. Thank you, Wendy. I'm actually going to build on some of the chai work and try to tie it into uh, the impact and, and clinical significance of um, some of our work <clears throat> together. Roger, can I interrupt real quick? Yep. Um, the slides you have are slightly altered to what Roger has that we'll be presenting on the screen, just so you're aware. It might not be exactly the same. <clears throat> That's my fault. I updated them the last minute, and they'll be uh, posted to the, to the portal. <clears throat> Oops, let me go back here. Uh, uh, building on these themes, and maybe for Pat's benefit, welcome to the group. Um, this uh, effort uh, of collaborating as a large community began uh, several years ago, but it was last March, a year ago March, that we had a face-to-face -face meeting and kicked off uh, this uh, collaboration across organizations. At that time, there were a whole series of uh, topics and opportunities and issues that were articulated uh, for which uh, people had priorities, and based on those, that's where the various learning models have uh, rolled out. One of the success factors in large-scale collaborations and, and smaller-scale collaborations is uh, leadership. Leadership's ability to drive the improvement, sustain the improvement, overcome the barriers, figure out how to collaborate across the environment. And so this leadership track was built into the WPCC meetings. And uh, each month, we've been taking a different module or topic and uh, working through it uh, to help support the work in the field. So that's why we're here today. And I'm going to build uh, on that. In that spirit, I'm going to be focusing on leadership's role as a convener and an influencer, influencing in an environment when you don't have control over the variables. Um, all of you are struggled with limited bandwidth, uh, time constraints, <laughs> organizational capacity and resources. I think it was Melody who said, we can't do this on our own. We have to figure out how to leverage and collaborate across the environment, how to leverage other uh, resources. So uh, we heard uh, at the summit, Dr. John Powell uh, uh, gave a, a series of uh, presentations that I thought were fairly powerful. I wasn't there, but I went onto the website to uh, hear the presentations. And he talked about othering. Uh, we tend to identify social groups as these others and uh, bucket them and then try to throw these all or nothing strategies uh, uh, at, the, at these groups. We, uh, we try to uh, apply universal principles without really understanding the needs of uh, the individual groups, without tailoring our, our interventions, our activities. And uh, came up with this term about targeted universalism. How could we start to target these efforts as we move forward. Now we talked earlier uh, in the meeting that in the fall we hope to uh, uh, accelerate a more population land focus and the possibility of uh, addressing a couple of core diseases like depression, diabetes, that all of you have art articulated as the highest priorities. So if you think of these concepts and you think of what we just heard, how might you be able to target and translate all this theory into action. How could we leverage work across the environment? 
I'd like to do is tell you a couple of stories. Uh, some of these stories I shared back way back in March, but they may have been out of context. So as you hear them, if you've heard them before, think about them in the context of what could we do here as a WPCC, and specifically to attack diabetes and depression. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about a story about dolphins. I'm going to tell you a story about a uh, one individual in a small town in England and how she transformed a community. Uh, and uh, then we'll, we'll do, do some other references. I threw up here just a quick reference of what might be possible. In Lafarge, Wisconsin, 92% uh, of women have, uh, after uh, a C-section have a natural childbirth following that. National average is 8%. Now that happens to be an Amish community. And in the Amish community, they targeted their intervention specifically to those households and collaborating across the environment, they're able to achieve those results. And one of the concepts that I wanna throw out here is the concept of abundance. Abundance is identifying what are the rich opportunities you already have and resources you already have in the environment. We're not getting a lot of new resources in. So how do you leverage the existing resources? So Marshall University in West Virginia is an example where they had a program with uh, children with severe disabilities. And they uh, were trying to introduce case management and care coordination to these population of children. And they just could not recruit or find any care managers and case managers. They said, where are the abundance of that resource? Where could we tap into that? And what they discovered is that children that reach the age of 18, they're either mainstreamed or they're in institutional facilities. But those mothers have gone through 18 years of perfecting the art of case management and care coordination. They've learned how to navigate every aspect of the environment. And they were an abundant resource in the community. So they went after these women who had reared children and got them through the system, and these children were either in long-term situations or mainstreamed, and uh, turned them into a workforce of care coordinators. That's the concept of abundance, trying to find that abundance in the community. So let me, whoops, let's see. How do we get to the end here? Let's see. Somehow, we got to the end, so let's start over here. So this is a story of a former uh, vice president for AT&T that helped them win the National Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. And uh, I actually uh, met Phil Scanlon uh, in a Baldrige training back in the uh, early, uh, late 80s, and early 90s. And he was talking about uh, going to the beach. And he was very excited that he was going to the beach. And he uh, happened to be from uh, New Jersey, lived in Morristown, New Jersey. And he was talking about, uh, he was taking a risk that he was uh, taking his family on a vacation and he rented a beach house with no television and no phones. And uh, he was bringing a house full of teenagers with their friends. So he said, this is my risk and I can't wait, it's gonna be fun and we have a lot of quality downtime. Well, they got to the beach and it rained for several days. And so by the time the, the rain passed, the, the kids uh, were uh, climbing the walls and uh, his nerves were frayed. And finally, they got to go down to the beach and they walked down the beach with all their chairs and umbrellas and equipment. And there were large signs, beach closed. And uh, the fifth day, the sixth day, the seventh day, the beach was closed. Uh, and it was due to, uh, in theory, it was due to pollution. High bacterial counts, the public health department had shut down the beach because of high bacterial counts in the actual sand and soil. There were also needles that had washed up on the shore and there was debris all up and down the, uh, the coast. And then uh, that uh, following Saturday, 749 dolphins washed up dead on the Jersey shore. Um, on the way home, the kids were talking about, this is the worst vacation we've ever had. This is just horrific. And dad, what are you gonna do about it? Dad, how are you gonna solve this pollution problem? And uh, Phil was like, who, who do you think I am? I mean, I can't possibly solve this pollution problem. And he thought about it all the way home and he said, what would it take to solve this problem? 
how could I, how can I, how can I go about tackling this problem? So he went to his, uh, his CEO and uh, asked if uh, AT&T could take this on as a community project, and he was rejected. He was basically thrown out of the office. He said, if you want to work on this on your own time, go for it. And yeah, you can use the conference rooms if you want to, but you have to do it after hours, and this can't cost us anything. So go see what you can do. So Phil sat back and did a little bit of homework, and he says, you know, I'm going to take a classic quality improvement approach to this, try to do some root cause analysis. I'm going to identify who the key stakeholders here are. I'm going to try to come up with some measures of performance. One of the measures of performance was beach closure days. How many beaches in each of the little towns were closed during the course of uh, the time period? And they start off with 855 beach closure days, and uh, they uh, estimated who was impacted by that, 1.8 million visitors, and uh, the lost revenue from tax revenue and sales, hotels, and others was $800 million that summer for the state of New Jersey uh, uh, from this incident. So it began a, jersey, a journey. He uh, worked with the federal government, two state governments, four counties, 90 individual shore municipalities, uh, the city of New York City, and the businesses that were all affected by uh, this issue. Uh, what they dis determined were a couple of factors. One was that 95% of the closures, the actual reason for closure, was uh, due to deteriorating storm drains. Now these were old terracotta storm drains that were built in the 1800s, and underneath the streets leading to the beach, they were cracked, and so sewage was seeping out and going into the beach. So they uh, worked with the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, the state of New Jersey to start to survey how many of these and then what could they do to, uh, to, to address it. Secondly, they found there were two trash haulers in New York City that were taking hospital weights down the Hudson River out into the Atlantic Ocean and basically dumping it off the Jersey Shore. So all of those needles and trash were washing up on the Jersey Shore. And the third, you see a picture here of some uh, old boats. What they found was that the piers in New York City that were built in the 1800s were rotting, falling apart, and drifting down the Hudson, and then landing on the Jersey Shore. So now they had three identified uh, 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 root causes, and then based on autopsies of the dolphins that the state had identified, what they found was this, the dolphins died from something called an infection called cravatoxin, and it was from the tribunal tin that was in uh, 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 paint for pleasure boats. So this paint had been introduced. They were all painting the boat's uh, bottom, and this was leaching in, causing a bacterial uptake, and then killing the dolphins. So um, they uh, decided, where are we going to get the money? So they worked with the state, and they came up with a campaign called Sure to Please. These were license, vanity license plates that were sold, and they were built by the Bureau of Prisons, and they were sold to raise the money to start to address some of these issues. They created totally voluntary infrastructure of different communities and businesses coming together. Uh, they put it in a transparent measurement process to feed back what was actually happening. They engaged the Corps of Engineers, and they engaged the prison bureaus, both in New York and New Jersey, and it was actually prisoners that went in and took out the old pilings in the harbor and then uh, had them uh, rebuilt. Uh, they were able to prosecute the illegal dumping from the hospitals uh, and the trash haulers. They raised a million dollars in the license plates that uh, helped them begin to fix some of the drainage systems. Uh, again, they worked with the Corps of Engineers. They passed some legislation on the tin, and uh, as I said, they used the prisoners in New York City. And as a result of that, the beach closure days went from 855 to 40. It uh, resulted in 50,000 jobs. And many of those were lost because of the, the prior season. Uh, $600 million in new taxes. And at the end of this, AT&T threw a banquet for everyone, claiming credit, of course, for this wonderful thing that they did. Uh, but the, that cost them $2,000 for the award dinner. Now, uh, I thought this is a very powerful lesson of being able to tackle the impossible. Nothing. But starting with a vision, starting with a will, starting with identifying what targeted interventions do we need to make, and then leveraging the abundance in the environment, really understanding what stakeholders are most affected by this and engaging those stakeholders. The um, second uh, case study is, uh, of, uh, uh, comes from Penwares, England. 
in, uh, it was called the Beacon Project in uh, Old Hill, Beacon and Old Hill Estates in uh, Falmouth and Cornwall, Southern England. Uh, this was affectionately re referred to by the locals as Beirut. It was uh, one of the uh, worst poverty counties uh, in, uh, in England. Uh, horrific, violent crime, mistrust, drug dealing, intimidation. Uh, lack of heating in many of the homes was causing asthma and respiratory problems in the community. 50% of the homes in a particular town were without any heat, and so they were burning wood and coal in fireplaces, which I hear is an issue in, in the community here. And their illness rate across the board was 18% above the national average. Hazel Stutley was a community social worker that worked with uh, the perinatal area and uh, was trying to deal with a lot of postpartum depression and issues that were associated with that in the community and also with child abuse and uh, the number of children that had to go into a register system and then placed into foster homes. So uh, she was getting increasingly frustrated in her own role uh, as just every day it just seems like this is a never-ending problem. There's just one family after another coming up with more social determinant of health issues, trauma, more adverse childhood events, and I don't seem to be getting anywhere. So she decided to shift tact, and they decided to engage the local community. Again, identifying what's the abundance. Uh, the abundance were the mothers of these families that are dealing with all these social determinants who wanted something to change but felt powerless. So she went out and did interviews of women across the community and found 20 women that thought had the interest and passion and leadership skills, but out of that found five that she thought could really start as a, as a small coalition, pull together the community residents and uh, work together. So they worked on mapping what are those homes that don't have heating and uh, could, uh, could be addressed. And lo and behold, found out that there was actually some government grant money available that they could go out there and start to address those homes. Uh, as a result, they installed energy efficient heating and insulation, again, a very targeted intervention. Um, but they also decided that while they were into these homes, many of them were very dilapidated and they needed new insulation. They needed new outside clapboard. And they said, while, we do, while, while we're doing this, why don't we change from this dreary gray town that we live in and start to paint these homes all bright pastel colors, bright turquoise and, and uh, orange and yellows and all of this. And as they started repainting the town, all these homes, all of a sudden they saw the mood of the town starting to change. The affect, the spirit starting to change of, of the community. Um, they looked at the literacy issues and, and the lack of employment, and they said, well, where, where's the abundance where people gather? And they said, well, they gather in the pubs. So they installed computers in the pubs, began training people computer classes and, and the skills to, to do that. Uh, they developed a, a fundraising program in the community and for those uh, around the community. Uh, they built a community resource center uh, as a place for the, the teens and others to gather. Uh, the impact of all of that, that crime uh, fell, burglaries were down 34%, violent crime down 50%. Uh, school exams of the children rose 18% for that uh, middle school uh, uh, age group. A 58% reduction in those child protection registries. The, the core of Hazel's work was uh, finding these families and getting those kids registered. 77% in postnatal depression reduction in that community and unemployment fell by 69%. So here again is a situation of it just seems absolutely overwhelming, absolutely impossible. Uh, where do I start? I start by really understanding what the issues are, going out there and engaging the community, identifying that coalition of the willing, looking for the abundance, looking for the resources that already exist. Uh, her statement was, we built up people's self-esteem through leading from behind, we were the enablers. We only take credit for kickstarting it and getting those people to a level of self-confidence and self-belief that they could carry on. And now nearly two years down the line, they have been able to sustain the work. So in this resource-constrained environment, the question is, how might we? We're gonna tackle depression and diabetes in the community. We can't just do it by our own internal quality improvement efforts. Clearly, there are huge social determinative health issues. 
And now we have the Chai's that are working on some of these social determinant of health issues. But what can we do to really leverage those issues around depression, diabetes, clinical issues, and what abundance might exist out there? So I just pulled into my resource glossary of what programs exist out there, what abundance is already in place across the country and in local communities addressing diabetes and, and, and depression in a variety of ways. So there's a lot of community coordinated events. There's a national program called Girls on the Run, an after school program where girls get together and the mothers lead this and they uh, train over a course of a season. And at the end, they have a little mini, mini 10K that the families all run together. But after school, getting these kids together in these cohorts ends up building their, their, their capacity, and they started weaving other educational programs on managing obesity and diabetes and other things to help build that cadre. In Parkersburg, West Virginia, they have a program in the morning before school called the One Miler. The kids uh, voluntarily showed up. They thought they would get very few kids. Most of the kids would show up before school and start this One Miler program. It became a socialization issue. Again, getting these kids activated and engaged, uh, addressing some of the core uh, obesity and activation skills. So you see there's a whole series of programs. The Stanford uh, Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. How, how many of you have heard of the CDSMP program from Stanford? Many, any in, in the room? A few people? Yeah. So this is a national program developed by uh, Kate Lorig. It was actually embedded in the national uh, CDC primary diabetes prevention trials. It was one of the most successful arms of the trial. It's a community-based program over 10 sessions where they bring uh, uh, cohorts of people with uh, chronic disease. The focus was diabetes. And through multiple sessions combining exercise and diet counseling and working with them in an outpatient setting, these were done at the YMCA. Uh, the YMCA now has a division of chronic disease, a medical director for chronic disease. They've been looking strategically across the country of what is their role long-term in managing and helping with chronic disease. Again, partnering across the country with uh, local clinics. Uh, a lot of FQHCs across the country have partnered with uh, the YMCA as well as other clinics. So those are examples of community-based uh, events. The right-hand side are hospital clinical coordinating uh, activities. Uh, our care is a uh, successful primary care system in Arkansas, very rural uh, communities and uh, very challenging social determinants, uh, similar to some of the ones that you challenge, are, are challenged with. And uh, they looked at what abundance is in the community and found that the school system, because the population had declined, because people moving out of the area for jobs, there were many abandoned schools that were sitting there. And so they went to the school system and said, what would it take to turn over the school to us and uh, we'll convert the gym into a community center, build a teaching kitchen, and start an exercise program and see if we can work with our local town. Well, that initial pilot led to them expanding that model and spreading it across the, the different communities. So again, uh, a, a large capital asset sitting there vacant, uh, being able to go in and with minimal expense working with the, the county, able to, to refurbish it. You see a lot of other programs up there. There are many, many of your organizations do workplace wellness clinics, a whole variety of different uh, programs. Uh, Scripps uh, in the community has a project, Dolce, which is a diabetes-focused uh, effort where they are the convener and trainer, but really the community helping to run the, the, these programs. In uh, Minnesota, there's the Alliance for a Healthy Generation. In San Diego, I mentioned uh, Dolce in San Diego, Wisconsin, the 21st Century for Community Learning Centers, after-school programs where they, they partner with um, the, the community and the care teams to look at how they can provide activities after school for all of the kids to build health literacy, engagement, and activity specifically focused on trying to reduce diabetes and other uh, related events. Um, Sibley Hospital in Washington, D.C. Uh, started this Taste and Talk program where they put up community grants for, organi for uh, individuals and communities to apply for uh, how would you tackle uh, the issue of food deserts and diabetes in your community. And they came, this one uh, couple, a uh, sister team, um, uh, took on this program and designed something called Taste and Talk. And it's a uh, four-session series where they bring uh, neighbors in, uh, ten women into the house 
and they cook them a uh, low carb, basically plant based meal, teaching them where to get the source of the materials and how to cook materials. And when they bring these women in, they uh, cook enough that they have a goodie bag that they have to take back for the rest of their family. And as a result of that, they end up uh, really engaging them. So these are all just you know, a myriad of examples. I have a resource at the end that's a catalog of 30 or 40 community programs around the country uh, that represent abundance. Models are there. It's a question of what needs to be done to bring them together. So where is the abundance in WPCC land? What programs are out there that you know? Let's take diabetes as a start. What programs are you aware of in this community that are already out there trying to tackle diabetes that if we brought them together with your work might result in really being able to accelerate improvement of the community? Any, any payers, for example, may have uh, targeted diabetes programs. Um, uh, could be other community events. Is anybody aware of any program in the community, diabetes program? Still doing it. CDSMP, so you're, you're doing that version within your system? Oh, it's a community. Oh, it's a community? Okay. Right. Nice. So healthy, healthy, and healthy adventures program. We heard, and then we heard the chronic disease self management program. Can you describe that working in the community? What's what's involved with that? Oh, she's good. She's not going to make you put up the sign. Uh, so ours is a peer led um, program, and it's six weeks. Um, and so it's just different people, either family members or people who themselves have chronic disease. And um, Caitlin Cork, who is my coworker, is the one that leads us or coordinates them. Super. Any other thoughts? Any other programs? Any of the payers sponsoring programs focused on diabetes for their other payers? I know Coordinated Care does have um, diabetes management for our members. So you have a, a, a yes, whole members. series of yes. collateral material and support and could be telephonic, web-based, other right, kinds of activities to support yeah. the members. Okay. Any others? So those are just two or three quick examples of uh, abundance in the environment where people are working on programs. Yes, someone else? As we have a behavioral health diabetes combined uh, group. We have group visits basically that we bring up every eight weeks or so. And so you're doing group visits internally your organization where you're we're bringing people with diabetes together yes. and then supporting them. And for that, you've had to develop educational material and yeah. coordinate that so that uh, they're not just sitting around, but they're really benefiting from the, uh, the yeah, model. We do that for depression management. As and well. you do it for depression management as well. Okay. Great. Uh, Family Health Centers has two tracks for that type of a group visit. One is put on by lay leaders with our community health workers. It's more of a support group. And then we have our group visits with a provider that are behavioral health integrated, where we have a behavioral health provider and a primary care provider. And those are meeting monthly, where it's it, we haven't perfected it yet. Um, unfortunately, we're still having to, again, have a foot in each camp with how do we bill for these. And we're having to, in essence, kind of dumb down the process in order to get paid for it, rather than being able to do it as well as we know it would work if we didn't have that, those same constraints. But we've had really great feedback from the patients who have been involved with those health integrated diabetes scripts. And it's, it has actually uncovered some of the depression things that we were not recognizing with our diabetes patients. Fantastic. And the, the one nice thing about having the two tracks is that way for our support groups that are led just by the lay community health workers, um, that there's no constraints on that as far as whether or not they're established with a certain payer or anything else it's kind of come and come whoever will and and you don't have the same kind of constraints as the group visits. super 
Uh, this is Jeannie from Catholic Charities. Um, yes. Actually, later today I have the opportunity to meet with Community Choice and Molina um, as far as partnering together for that layperson diabetes education for our case managers. So I'm really excited about that. I wish we would have had this conversation three months ago as I was kind of in the desert as far as where these resources were. Fantastic. Anyone else on the phone? So think forward to the fall, and let's say you do decide to work on diabetes and depression. Be thinking about how, how might we leverage all the work that's going on with the CHIs and some of these community resources to really focus and target on those populations where we want to really move the needle. Um, you know, it, it begins by being a convener, finding within your staff who are those leads, whether it's yourself or someone else that has a natural affinity or that's part of their role. Are they a lead that could be a convener? We could pull a group together. Can we really drill down and start to understand the data like we started with asthma? Can we drill down on the diabetes data in the community and look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the hot spots and the clusters and where there are areas, the, sub, the segments of the population where uh, we might be able to really make inroads? And then who are the champions? What is the abundance within those segments? If there is a cluster of, let's say, a Hispanic population in a particular community, is that an area where we could tap in some of the local resources and bring them to the table to help leverage all of this? Uh, uh, so this, this notion of segmenting and this targeted uh, universalism, if you will. Uh, identifying what the gaps are. How could we bridge those gaps? What, what are the resources that optimally would do that? And then really mapping that, as I said, there's that abundance. What are, what are the programs already there? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's leverage them and uh, bring them to bear. Uh, align the silos as much as we can, and then uh, identify the, any new programs and see if there's some opportunities, perhaps do some uh, rapid prototyping, the, the application of design thinking and other tools to develop some new programs. So this builds on the CHI conversation. It's a precursor to thinking about the fall. Uh, the ask is for you to, to think about your own programs. Are there champions within your organizations that you uh, might want to think about uh, engaging them uh, and starting the thought process? And as we start to move towards uh, a more concrete plan in the fall, could we put together a group of conveners to start to figure out how to leverage all this abundance and these resources and come up with a novel program that really takes advantage of your internal QI efforts, external social determinants efforts, and targeted interventions leveraging this abundance in the community. Any questions or comments or, or observations or reflections based on what I just said? Does this resonate at all? Is this too abstract? I see some nodding heads. Any other thoughts or comments? Anybody on the phone? Uh, this is Jamie again from Catholic Charities. Um, I think it would be helpful on our end. We've had really good um, success in working with Amerigroup. They've um, been able to coordinate with us and um, get some programs going for our staff um, and for our clients. Um, it would be good to have some of those other resources available to us, like um, if Coordinated Care has a program for diabetes, I sure would like to know how to access that for our Coordinated Care clients. So part of the work that could take place is to really catalog all of these resources in abundance and pull it together so that we can really take advantage and focus and understand what, what is uh, really the, the, the meat behind the models and how to then really scale it across those uh, segmented populations. And again, this is an opportunity for the individual payers to work with their uh, beneficiaries and the, uh, all of you as, uh, as contracted uh, entities and try to leverage those resources and then uh, backfill with some of these other programs uh, in, in the market and see if we could really move the needle for many, many of these programs. Uh, but again, leveraging what already exists, not trying to uh, ask all of you to contribute to gigantic resources, but how can we really leverage this across the environment? Any other thoughts or comments? Uh, Peter. The one who doesn't wave a sign at me. <laughs> 
So I'm, I'm particularly interested in the connectivity between uh, the healthcare providers and the social determinants. I mean, one of the one of our objectives in the Whole Person Care Collaborative is to, you know, promote uh, work with social determinants. So at the next chai, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be pulling together. This is in Okanagan, a whole group of people, and looking for uh, success stories or opportunities where people are actually doing this well. Um, you know, as Melody said, it can be discouraging. You know, we go to these seminars and get all excited and we go back and we do our, you know, how do we fill the schedule? How do we see the patients, uh, you know, write scripts, write referrals to specialty? How do we, you know, who, who's doing well with this? Who's making inroads? Who has some success stories to talk about in terms of referring and supporting the organizations and social determinants? So heard from uh, Kelsey about, you know, we are doing Stanford model, um, on uh, living well with chronic disease and all that, but uh, how many provider groups are really referring you know, robustly uh, and monitoring patients and you know supporting them in that process? That's what I'm interested in. So if people have best practices they want to share, I'm, I would love to hear about it. Wendy, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Roger. That is the... Um the thing that I've heard from several in the site visits, Peter, is um, trying to address social determinants, um, screening patients, yet um, when they, uh, you find there's an issue, what do, you, what do you have in your community to support that? And many times there's not a whole lot in the community to support that. So what can you do to partner with, um, say, CHIs, because the CHIs is that coalition for health improvement to start to address some of those issues. Where are the gaps? Um, in the social determinants of health or assisting um, assisting those patients to um, addressing those social determinants of health and how can you as a community help address those. So I think those are some examples. I'm going to move on. Anything else anyone wants to share based on what Roger has talked about, what we're doing as a WPCC within our change plan, experiences you've encountered? Okay, we have 10 minutes, 12 minutes, or no, we got a 45, my math is off, seven minutes. Let's do a quick round table of what's going on, successes that you've been, I heard a lot of my site visits, so don't tell me you're gonna pass. I know better this time, so um, I'll start with Blake, since Melody had the floor. And don't forget your microphone. Let's see, well, we, you know, transitioned our, specialty uh, behavioral health uh, providers onto Athena in December. And so we've continued to improve uh, the ways that they're engaging with the PCPs and, and other providers um, in an integrated way. Um, that's something that we're continuing to improve upon. We are also, um, we made some adjustments um, mid-March. We began one day a week to dedicate of our behavioral medicine providers um, at 600 Durando all day with the pediatrics uh, providers um, in order to do some targeted work there on the, the day that all our pediatric providers, 600 Durando are on site. And then we're going to do the same thing at Columbia Pediatrics um, starting next month, uh, one day a week, having a dedicated BMET provider. So, um, yeah, so we're in the midst of innovating. And that work started um, with that behavioral health plan, is that correct? It did. So, so yeah. you know that some of the work is continuing up the, the lands. And I remember being at their site when they said, we haven't even sat in the same room together for this, that one session. So I think there, there was some talk, but not actually meeting. That's great work that you're actually asking. Um, so Columbia Basin Family Medicine in Ephrata, we started doing social determinants of health screening in April. And um, we've been building our care coordination program for the last two years. And in the last 90 days, we started the community health worker position. And we've trained her um, to be assisting the care coordination and things like that. But in the social determinant of health screening, we've come across individuals who don't have phones. And um, how do we reach them? Well, 
fortunate we have a community health worker that we can send to the home, but that's not a sustainable um, fix, at least not yet. We haven't figured it out, but that's something that we need to do some work on. Nice work. Kathleen? Um, I, I think there's no, no big thing that we've been doing in the last several months except that we're furthering down the road of team-based care and doing everything we can to empower people who have certain skill sets to utilize those skills. Um, so many times we venture onto a community improvement workflow and um, I just honestly believe that when you have the right people in the room, the answers are in the room, and it's getting those people to engage and share what their ideas are. So, um, it, you know, it's a brainstorming process in, in some cases, but again, um, empowering the right person to do the job, and that's helped us expand our, our uh, chronic disease management. Our, our uh, nurse who oversees that doesn't always have the time to do every piece of it, but she's given the the authority to um, to delegate certain tasks to other people and engage people like our PSRs who might be, um, I think you were talking about getting front, front desk staff to be more engaged with the social determinants and um, including everybody in some of our, not some, all of our team meetings so that we hear from every area of the clinic. Um, I think, you know, that that's what it takes. And I, one of the keys that we hold is that we have a very engaged um, medical director who really owns things on the provider side and looks for answers from from the MA, from the PSR, from people that sometimes don't feel the um, okay about telling a provider what they need because they, they think that person knows everything. So uh, it's just that free-flowing communication that's been the best thing that we can offer each other as a team. So I guess rather than a specific process, that's what I would have to say. Thank you. Lisa? Perfect. First time with the microphone, so I'm pretty excited I knew which button to push. <laughs> um, well, we are kind of experiencing a little bit of frustration when it comes to the change plans um, because we um, solved one problem and then inadvertently created another. Um, I, I guess going into this had this vision that we were, you know, we had all these change plans and, you know, we had these dates and we were going to do this change plan and then that would be finished up and then we'd move on to the next change plan and here we are several months later and we're still on our very first change plan and that's uh, what we felt most important at the time was increasing access to our patients. It was the number one complaint by all of our stakeholders and it was the number one complaint with our clients. So it was very important to us. And um, we succeeded. We are getting people in the same day that they're requesting services, which we're super excited about that. Um, but now what do we do with all these people? Because they're, they've come in the door, so we've virtually moved at, We've moved the bottleneck from this point in time to now this point in time. And so we have providers with these huge caseloads. And so we're kind of grappling with that. So it's triggering my OCD just a little bit because I really wanted to just wrap this one up with a bow and then move on to the next one. I didn't know it was going to open this huge can of worms. Um, so we're just, we're kind of, you know, trying to figure it out. And of course, we've had some significant staffing changes, which I don't know why people have to leave. It just messes <laughs> with the timeline of everything we're trying to do. Um, but I get it. Uh, so yeah, that's just kind of where we are in, in halting. And I just, I really wish we could clean it up a little bit, but I guess it's, it's not a clean process. <laughs> So I, I have a couple things, <clears throat> and I probably should have said this a long time ago, but I kind of feel like the social determinants of health should be a priority for our change plan, whereas it's been set up as for health integration and chronic disease. Maybe it's because I'm a social worker at, health, at the heart, um, but if the idea of social determinants of health is something that could impact or may impact every person in our communities. Even myself, I could lose my job tomorrow. So I don't know if this is good, this is just diary of the mouth or if it's a statement or a question or what, but <laughs> it's just one of those things where 
we had the focus on these social determinants of health, even for you, mm -hmm. it might move that bottleneck that you have with your therapist discharging people a lot faster. Mm -hmm. But I, guess that I just at some point would like to see that be the priority um, in the future, I guess. So, but as far as something positive to share, we've had a diabetes project going on for some time now. Um, I don't remember all August. the, yeah, August, August or so. I, I don't have all the numbers right off the top of my head, but the one number that always sticks with me is, is that it, of the population that is being screened and has positive screens, we have 99% of those people are having coordination continuity care with the primary care following that positive screen. So. That's great. Thanks for sharing. You guys are off the hook unless you have some burning something you want to share because we are at the, the time time frame. So thanks everyone for coming and we will see you in June in Moses Lake.